Let's go ahead and talk a little bit now about some other early events of World War II. And these were all examples of German aggression uh, prior to, to other European countries entering the war. Uh, so this is really prior to the declarations of war issued by France and Germany after the invasion of Poland. These are all things that happened prior to that. And there really was a pattern here where the Germans would go ahead and, and push the envelope, push the boundaries, and see what, how much they could get away with. And every time somebody let them get away with it, they'd try a little bit more. The policy became known as appeasement, actually. Um, that the actually begins in an area of Germany called the Rhineland. According to the Treaty of Versailles, the Germans were not supposed to have military forces in the Rhineland. And Adolf Hitler goes ahead and, and, did not, and uh, rejects this proposition, goes ahead and puts uh, forces in, in the Rhineland. And France and Britain basically say, well, that's okay, and they don't do anything about it. They basically say, we wish you hadn't done it, but uh, we're not going to stop you. And so after this, Adolf Hitler's a little bolder. Now he goes ahead and he turns his attention to another country, Austria. Um, here, he, they, they, the whole thing starts off with German propaganda, where the Germans accuse the Austrians of abusing a German minority in Austria. And the, Adolf Hitler says he, should, he needs to stick up for the Germans who are there. And... Uh, this this goes ahead and leads him to to have a meeting with uh, Austrian Chancellor Kurt von Schuschnigg. Uh, Hitler invites von Schuschnigg uh, to his villa up in the Bavarian Alps. And once von Schuschnigg arrives, Adolf Hitler begins um, yelling at him, begins trying to bully him, basically into signing an agreement that that he would give Germans uh, and Austria basically some special treatment. Von Schuschnigg is appalled by this. He's, he he says no. Uh, Hitler issues an ultimatum and says, look, you either do what I want or we're going to go ahead and invade and make sure it gets done. And von Schuschnigg walks out. He, he's not going to be treated that way. But Hitler remains good to his word, and on March 12, 1938, he annexes Austria. In other words, he makes Austria part of Germany. Uh, the, the thing is called the Anschluss, or the Union, the Union of Germany and Austria together. And significantly, there's no real significant German, or uh, excuse me, Austrian uh, opposition here. Uh, this is not an armed conflict. This isn't a huge battle that takes place. In, in several towns, as the Germans rolled in, the Austrians welcomed them uh, because they, they looked at what Adolf Hitler had done for Germany and, and getting them out of the Great Depression, and they were hoping that he could turn around their economy as well. Uh, and so some folks in Austria, not all, but some welcomed the arrival of the Germans. After Austria is, is taken over by Germany, uh, then uh, Hitler goes ahead and turns his attention to Czechoslovakia, another neighbor. And he starts off with a small piece of Czechoslovakia, not, not the whole. Uh, he, he starts off with what's called the Sudetenland. Uh, there's a large German minority there, and uh, Adolf Hitler claimed they were being persecuted, they weren't being respected, and once again, he, as the leader of Germany and the German peoples, needed to stand up for Germans in Czechoslovakia. So, in much the same manner as he did with von Schuschnigg, he invites the leader of Czechoslovakia, their president, a guy by the name of Hacha, uh, who, who was elderly by this point, um, he invites him to Berlin. And Hakka goes ahead and comes to Berlin uh, from Czechoslovakia. It's a, a train ride that takes several hours. And when Hakka arrives, uh, Hitler goes ahead and whisks him directly from the train station. He has drivers there. doesn't allow him to, to rest. So Hakka's a little weary. He's an older guy. Uh, and he comes into Hitler's office. Hitler begins yelling at him. He begins bullying him just like he did with von Schuschnigg. But Hakka goes ahead and, and, and knowing that Adolf Hitler would invade anyway, as, as was evidenced by Austria, Hacke goes ahead and signs over the Sudetenland and says, okay, I'll give you the Sudetenland. And so now he, uh, Adolf Hitler has taken, uh, taken his, his second and made a second acquisition, so to speak. Uh, this upsets um, Aus uh, France and Great Britain and, uh, and, and several other, uh, the United States, we're all of a sudden starting to worry about, okay, what is Adolf Hitler up to here? Uh, and so we meet with him in Munich. And uh, there uh, uh, Hitler goes ahead and, and promises that that he's done, he really doesn't want anything else, you know, he, he's, he really, he has no intentions of conquering Europe, that all these fears that he, he's expansionist and he's taking over Europe are misguided, and, um, and that happens in September 1938, and, and probably most famously, you know, Neville Chamberlain, the, the uh, Prime Minister of Britain, comes home and says, you know, we've secured peace for our times, that, hey, you know, we're not going to go to war, and everyone's like, oh, thank goodness we're not going to go to war. Um, by March of 1939, six months after the Munich Pact, Adolf Hitler will invade the rest of Czechoslovakia. Uh, the Munich Pact is the single best example of appeasement. Hey, okay, if we just give him the Sudetenland, maybe he'll be happy and maybe he'll stop. Adolf Hitler was never happy. Um, and, and he kept taking more and more until somebody stood up to him and stopped him. Uh, the next example after taking Czechoslovakia, again, about six months later, September 1939 now, a year after the signing of the Munich Pact, 
Adolf Hitler rolls the tanks into Poland. This is the first example of Blitzkrieg, Lightning War. What makes this possible is a non-aggression pact that he signs with the Soviet Union. Again, Adolf Hitler didn't want to have a two-front war. He wanted to deal with one side at a time. So he signs this agreement that, hey, if we invade Poland, uh, Soviets, you promise not to go ahead and, and declare war on us. In return, we'll give you the eastern half of Poland. In reality, Adolf Hitler was buying time. And so was Joseph Stalin, Joseph Stalin, the leader of the Soviet Union. They both knew that they hated each other, actually. And they both knew that there was going to be a war here. But Adolf Hitler didn't want to fight a two-front war. Joseph Stalin's army wasn't ready to fight the Germans. And he needed time to, to go ahead and prepare. And so this was kind of delaying the inevitable, this non-aggression pact. But it did allow uh, Germany to go ahead and take over Poland. At this point, Britain and France see what's happening, that this is, this is not going to end well. And so they go ahead and declare war September 3rd, 1939, two days after the invasion of Poland, and World War II officially begins. Again, other signs that we, we should have looked for uh, that, that should have let us know the way the Germans were treating some of their own people. Uh, besides invading other countries, uh, how they were treating the Jews inside Germany. The Nuremberg Laws uh, were, were a way to basically discriminate against Jewish people. Uh, it said that Jews were not allowed to be German citizens. Uh, Jews were not allowed to attend public schools. They were not uh, allowed, again, Germany at the time had a, a public uh, medical facility or public medical system. Uh, and they said, no, you you're weren't allowed to participate in that. So they excluded them. Uh, one of the dangers of having you know, the government control a healthcare system or a school system. If they will choose to exclude a group that they disfavor, they certainly can. Uh, segregating the Jews out. They had ghettos where they uh, put the Jews in certain cities, especially in Poland, places like Warsaw. Uh, the Jews had a curfew. They were had to be in, inside by 8 p.m. And all Jews had to identify themselves. Probably one of the more notable things from the Holocaust uh, with the Star of David on their clothing. Uh, the Crystal Knight is another example of how the Germans were mistreating the Jews, also called the Crystal Knock. Uh, it takes place November 7th, 1938. It's sparked really by the assassination of a German diplomat. Uh, the, the guy, German diplomat, travels to Paris, uh, and while in Paris, uh, a 17 year old uh, uh, Jewish refugee uh, who, who had, his family had had to flee Germany because of the persecution there, he was bitter about this, and he decides to go ahead and strike back at the Germans. And the only way he, he felt like he could, and that was to assassinate this German diplomat. And in retaliation for that assassination, um, on the night of November 7th, 1938, a thousand Jews will be murdered in, in Germany. Uh, synagogues will be burned. Jewish businesses and homes, uh, windows will be broken and they'll be uh, looted and destroyed. Uh, the reason it's called the night of, uh, uh, the Crystal Night is because of the night of broken glass. There's so much glass in the streets of some German towns that under the street lights, they, they seem to glitter. The streets glitter like they're made of crystal, and that's where the name the Crystal Knight comes from. Uh, it's also at this point where the, the, the um, Germans really begin to round up the Jews and ship them off to what will become the concentration camps. On that night, November 7, 1938, in response to that assassination, they will round up 26,000 Jews and ship them off to what will become the concentration camps. And, and, and the refugees coming out of, of Germany at this point um, trying to get it anywhere they could, telling stories like this. Again, we should have understood that, hey, this was a bad actor. This was a guy that really was somebody we needed to be worried about. There were plenty of signs there. 